Okay, so we've started into a series on our vital values and we're gonna start uh, uh, looking at these. We started last week, uh, we looked at, at uh, proclamation, we proclaim is our first value. Uh, and uh, it's not, we don't just proclaim anything, we proclaim Jesus Christ, uh, crucified, died, risen again, ascended into heaven, that's who we proclaim. Uh, the second value that, that uh, you know, we are gonna be looking at this morning uh, is actually not, we transform is the next one after that. This morning we're looking at we worship, I've got them slightly out of order, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, and then the others are, we pray, we give, we mobilize and we serve. These seven values, our elders have uh, worked for a year and a half trying to figure out what, what really is at the core of who we are as a church. There's seven distinctives that give us direction in our ministry and tell us to, what to invest our time in as a people. And these are gonna guide us into the 21st century and help us to be responsive to the ordination of God upon us. Listen to that, to the ordination of God upon us. Ordination, we usually think of ordination as something that you, you know, a, a vow that a, uh, someone who's gonna be a religious worker uh, engages in. You know, Chris and I are both ordained, as they say, okay? And that, all that that really does for us, uh, you know, in, in functional terms is it puts R-E-V in front of our name. Uh, and that's how you usually think of ordination. But I want you to think of the people of God, of a particular people of God, as ordained. We are a people together, either because of some accident, you know, a, a group or maybe just an individual got here in 1841 and decided that there were enough farmers and factory workers in Pequannock who needed God and they decided that this was a good place to plant a church. Somebody gave them the land, I, guess, I assume, or they just took it because no one you know, cared about it and I think it was probably donated uh, and they started a church. Sounds kind of accidental to me. The other possibility is that a people like us exists because God ordained it, because God called it into being. Now it's one of the two, or maybe it's both. Maybe on a functional level, on a human level, people didn't really think it out all that carefully. Maybe they just said, we really should have a church in Pequannock. And so they put one here. But maybe at the same time, simultaneously, maybe God was ordaining that a congregation be called into existence, that a people be formed for his glory. And that's what ordination means. And if we can see ourselves as being here ordained by God, it will absolutely change our existence as a church. We're not just here because we've been here. We're not just here because there's always been a church on this corner. In fact, there hasn't always been a church on this corner. It only goes back to 1841. And in his providence, God keeps blowing it down over the years and rebuilding. And it's so that, you know, God ordains congregations that not just, not just that congregations thrive and survive. I'll bet that there are some mega churches out there with 20, 30,000 people in them that God did not ordain to be a people before him. And you, you can actually see them that happen. When you, when you go to those places, you go, something's missing here. Uh, and just in the same way, I, I think that there are congregations of 10 people that are ordained to be a congregation. The church that I served up in, in uh, New Hampshire uh, the, uh, just before I came down here, uh, Emmanuel Community Church in Concord had 18 people. That was, that was on a good day. We had 18 people. And uh, about six of them were over 90 years old. And I believe that that congregation was absolutely ordained into being. They did not, everyone in the world was telling them, you guys got to quit. This, it's done, it's over. The, the, you, 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 there's not enough here to call to church. But they sat down with me and they said, we don't want to quit. We love being a church together. We think God has a purpose for us. Guess what, they're still there. 
And there's still, in the low 20s, I think Randy has told me, Randy Thompson, who used to be here, is now the pastor there. That's a whole other story. <laughs> God sometimes ordains a congregation into being. It used to be that there was, a, there was a time when you could put a sign out on the street that said, God's church, whatever, you know, God's Presbyterian church, God's Methodist church, God's whatever church. And people would simply show up you know, there was a movie, you know, Field of Dreams, you know, if you build it, they will come. That used to be the way that churches were. You build a church, you had people. That's not today. That's not the way that, that the, the world is relating to the church today. Today, people need a compelling reason to be a part of a church. Last week, we said our creed, our mission, and our values. Make that case. Listen. They make that case to us. Our creed, the things we believe, our mission, what we believe our, our, our plan of action is, and our values, the things that we take as priorities. Make the case for why we are a congregation to us. To everyone else, we make the case. There's not the time to say all of those things. You sit down with somebody and you're sharing about, you know, about your life. It, it, would not, it would take you way too long to share your creed and your mission and your values with anyone. What you want to do is you want to tell them about Jesus in as simple and human terms as you possibly can. And so our second vital value is worship. Now, on this list... Uh, go back just one screen for a second. On the list, I've got them ordered th uh, differently. And there's a reason why I put worship here today. Because proclamation and worship, as you're about to see, are so very closely allied. But I didn't want you to think of these values, and the elders don't want you to think of these values, in terms of priority. Your top value is not proclamation and everything else is below it. These are all equally important for this church. So I'm taking things a little out of order so that I can put the, these two statements together. We proclaim, we worship. Now, if you can, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 1 Chronicles, Old Testament book. And these are the chronicles of the kings of uh, the Jews. Uh, these are the chronicles of the kings of Israel and, uh, of, and of Judah. And it begins with the United Kingdom and the story of David. And in the middle of David's story, or part of David's story, has David and the people uh, settling in Jerusalem. And as they settled in Jerusalem, they brought the Ark of the Covenant that God had caused to be made, had, and, and very detailed work that he had had artisans create uh, this ark, which was to display his splendor, and uh, it was the mercy seat, it was also the place, sort of the locus for the worship of God. And they brought the ark into the tent of meeting. There's no temple yet. It, this is all done in tents, and David, at one point, uh, if you know the, this story, at one point David bemoans the fact, he says, I live in a house of cedar, and God is dwelling in a tent. That's not right. That's kind of what led to uh, Israel asking God if we could build a, a temple for him. But this, uh, this moment is where we're, when we arrive at uh, 1 Chronicles 16, is the moment at which they brought the ark for the first time into the tent. Now the, the place where the worship of God would be held. And uh, just before we get into it, it's this, this is a psalm that David wrote, but it doesn't appear in its entirety in the 150 psalms that are collected in your Bible. This, is, this psalm stands alone all by itself over here in 1 Chronicles 16. It's no different from the, the psalms that you read, uh, that we, we read every Sunday. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16 contains a psalm, a song that David wrote. This is lyric poetry in Hebrew. 
Uh, the Psalms were intended to be sung or chanted or recited by the people. And this particular Psalm figures very prominently because David gave it to Asaph and the, Le the Levites on this day that they brought the ark into the tent and placed the tent where it was going to be permanently on, uh, in Jerusalem up on Mount Zion. Now, the worship of God was now fixed to one place. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of years later, the synagogue system began to develop. That's a whole different thing. Synagogues are teaching places primarily. They're not worshiping places primarily. So the worship of God was fixed to this place and ultimately ends up in the temple. And there's evidence to suggest that David may have intended this psalm to be sung as the basis for their liturgy, for the, the, the order of their worship, and not to be omitted ever. In other words, th there's, basis, there's a thinking that says that this psalm stands alone over in 1 Chronicles 16 because David intended it to be the opening psalm of every time of worship that they had. So it's very important. Uh, the psalm does not, as I said, appear at, in its entirety in our book of Psalms, but Psalms 96, 105, and 136 all have major verbatim quotes from this psalm. So that's part of why they think that it was so important. All right, let's look at it. So we're starting at verse 23. We're halfway through the psalm. I didn't have the time this morning to do the whole psalm. It's very long. But, so we're just taking a segment of it. But, but this is the segment that this has to do with our worship. It says, sing to the Lord all the earth. I'm reading from the uh, ESV. You're, if you're using the Pew Bibles, that's the NIV. So there may be a word or two different. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. All right, I want to pick out some, some features of this. First of all, God is the Lord. For that, now that may sound kind of, you know, uh, simplistic. God is the Lord. Uh, but when, whenever you see in your scriptures the word L-O-R-D and all the letters are capitalized, big L and small capitals, O-R-D, that is to replace a word or a, a four-letter thing that is uh, from Hebrew. Uh, we transliterate it, Y-H-W-H. It's called the, this is not something you really need to know, but this, it's called the tetragrammaton, tetra four, the four-letter word, <laughs> okay? The tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, which is the name of God, uh, which in Exodus chapter three, God gave to Moses. It says, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Y-H-W-H, take all the vowels out. That's what you're left with. And he said, say to this people, to the people of Israel, Y-H-W-H, I am has sent you has sent me to you, brother. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the I am, the... Now, the 16th century Christians added the vowels back in, and so you may have heard the name Jehovah. The Jehovah, Yehovah, Yehovah is how it pronounces in Hebrew. But they don't pronounce it. The Jews don't pronounce it because it's so holy. So we put in the Lord in our modern English translations instead of Yehovah. Okay? But it's the same word. The, the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I'm to be remembered throughout all generations. Oh, good. That's all we need to know. That's all the interaction with God we need to have. The rest is remembrance. Not so. That word remembered is an active word. This shall be my memorial, God is saying. This is how you are going to deal with me throughout all generations. This is how you're going to know me throughout all generations. I will be Y-H-W-H. I am. I am self-existent. I am always. I'm eternal. 
And there's so much more. One last thing before we leave that. This God, it says, is for all the earth. This God is for all people. This is the God who is God over all people, whether they know it or not. So that's the first thing we get out of verses 23 and 24. Sing to the Lord. That's the Lord is God. All the earth. Tell of his, this particular person, this one who revealed himself to Moses. He is God. No one else. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. There's a second thing that we learn from this, these two verses, that we're going to declare God's salvation. It's a very interesting word. God's declare his salvation is all one word. You know what it is? Yeshua. Declare Yeshua among the nations. Well, that sounds familiar. What do, how do I know that? Well, that translates into English, Joshua. It translates into Greek, and also into Spanish, by the way, as Jesus, Jesus. Declare Yeshua, declare the salvation of God, declare Jesus among the nations. So worship and proclamation are deeply connected to one another. When he says God is salvation, when he says, he says, declare my salvation, that's a prophecy. Matthew 1, 21, uh, the angel said about Mary, she will bear a son and you will call his name Yeshua. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We're to tell of God's Yeshua from day to day. You're to declare the glory of God from day to day, to day, to day, to day. That's what we do. That's who we worship. And that's why proclamation and worship are so allied to each other. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Declare his glory among the nations. So worship, sung and spoken, sing to the Lord is absolutely allied with declaration. All right, second thing. Uh, this is also in verse 23 and 24. It has to do with the way that we worship. I, I just alluded to it. Sing, declare. Those are the two major words you see on the page in front of you. Psalm 96, one of the psalms, which is a quote from this. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Colossians 3, in the New Testament, as they were beginning to figure out Christian worship, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When we sing in worship, we're obeying this specific command. And when we speak in the praises of God in worship. We are obeying this specific command. Sing and declare. Sing and declare. That's, a, that's what our worship should be all about. Now, no matter what is being sung during public worship, and what I mean by that is, as long as it is uh, consistent with Christian truth, okay? If, if you ever come in here and we ask you to sing something, that has nothing to do with God, we ask you to say, you know, perhaps other than maybe as an object lesson, but if we started to talk, to sing about, you know, humanism, and that was going to be, all of our hymns were going to be about humanism, flee, run away. That's not what this is about. That's not worship. It isn't. Worship has to do with the one who's being worshipped. And that's the YHWH, that's Yeshua, that's, that's the God who spoke to Moses and who speaks today. So no matter what we're singing in public worship, or maybe a better way of putting it is, no matter what the music sounds like, because the words 
should all be directed to the praise of his glory. No matter what the music sounds like, and this will come as a shock to all of us at some point. If you sit there and cross your arms because this isn't your style of music or because you think that you can't sing, two reasons why people just sit there sometimes. But I don't like the style of music or B, I can't sing. You're in sin. Plain and simple. If you sit there on a Sunday morning with your brothers and sisters around you and you refuse to open your mouth when we are collectively declaring his praise, you're in sin. Because you're refusing to do what the psalm said. You're refusing to sing to the Lord. Imagine that. I don't like this song. It's too trite for me. All it says, you know, all this song says is, you know, uh, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Repetitious, 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 because he first loved me. I don't like that song, so I'm just going to sit here. I don't like, I don't like the, the tune. The tune too, sounds too much like radio music to me. I don't like to listen to music on the radio. So I'm just going to sit here. I don't relate to the, the hymn we started off with this morning. It sounds like classical music. In fact, it was classical music. It's Finlandia. It's part of Sibelius' work. But if you sit there on a Sunday morning and you say, I'm going to separate myself from all these people around me. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm just going to sit here. You're in sin. Also, if you say, I can't sing, you might be right. You don't have a, you know, you can't hold a tune in a bucket. Big deal. Lend your voice. Lend your voice any way you can, even if all you're doing is reciting the words out loud in time. Lend your voice out loud. Make a joyful noise to the, the Lord, all the earth, it says. Do not ignore the one who you are praising. It's disturbing when people do that. And if I walk into a, a church that has a completely different culture than the one I'm used to, I owe it to the people of God around me to at whatever level I'm able to get involved. Because it's all about engagement. Are you engaged in worship? And if you're just sitting there, you're not engaged. You say, oh, I was praying. Okay, well, then you're praying alone. You're not doing what God's people are doing. And so you're missing something, you're missing something vital. The second thing is that we declare, it says. We sing and we declare. This is why proclamation is so tied to our worship. That's why our service, but I, I don't know where, where anyone ever came up with that the times of gathering for a church were called worship services. I, I, I've got to research that someday. But anyway, this is why our service includes spoken psalms and the public reading of scripture and the declaration of the word through preaching. That's all for us. That's all for those who know him. It's how we learn to sing his praises. And the two work together. We declare and we sing. We declare and we sing back and forth. We declare his glory among the nations, it says. We're commanded to tell the world about YHWH, YHWH about Yahweh, about Yeshua. Again, if you will not tell the world around you about the God that you worship, you are in sin. Yes? Sure, you can, anyone, by the way, you can always ask, but you don't have to be uh, related to me in order to ask a question. Yes? Right? Feel 
Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I'll, for those who don't have uh, good hearing, she said, said what, what do you do if your soul is so cast down when you arrive for worship? You, the, the very best you were able to do this morning because you're in mourning or because you're in lament or because something is just so troubling to you. And all you could barely do was just to be here. And I think, uh, I think that the, what tempers this is, I, when I say that, I don't mean every Sunday. Because there are mitigating circumstances. There are reasons that, that, and I'm glad you brought it up, there are reasons sometimes that you just can't. But we owe it to you if we notice that, if we say, wow, uh, Jamie, you weren't singing in, in worship. You were just sitting, you looked like you were so sad. Did anyone notice that? Did anyone notice the person next to you who, who wasn't able to sing this morning? who wasn't able to join in, who was just there. There could be two, there's, there's two reasons. You might be in sin, as I said before, but you also might be in such turmoil and such trouble that the very best you could do was to show up. And absolutely, that's right. Uh, and that's not sin. That is obedience. You were here just because of your obedience. And I, and I appreciate that, that distinction. Yes. Uh, Jesus' name means salvation. I mean, Jesus' name means God is salvation, in, in, if you translate it out. And that's why he's the one that we worship. You know, uh, we're worshiping his salvation. So, so we're going to declare his glory. Again, not every day. Not, you know, every day you're not going to be someone who is in a position, emotionally uh, or any other way, to uh, you know, go and, and you know, take um, you know, brownies and Jesus to your neighbor. Um, but as a lifestyle, as a norm, it, you know, we are called, we're told to speak his praises, to declare his glory among the nations. That means you're gonna be telling people. And, and when the people of God gather together this is probably more germane to, our, to the subject of what we're talking about. When the people of, of God gather together and decide that together we will declare his praises to all people, then we as a church are engaging in a unique way with the mission that God has ordained us for. And so when, when we say we're going to take on a priority of reaching out to the community in a certain way that's going to bring Jesus to the, to the people. And we did this last weekend, by the way. Uh, Chris asked us all, and I know this is, kind of sounds trite and sort of silly, but he asked us all to wear our, our T-shirts if we were going to be uh, you know, helping. That was an invitation for people to walk up and say, hey, what, what are you guys all about? And the simplest answer is it's on the back of my T-shirt. You know, it's great. And again, sometimes you cannot, because you are in lament, there are times when you are in such turmoil in, in your own life that you simply cannot do this. I'm not saying that this is always and ever. This is, this is the norm. This is just the norm for the people of God. Should be to sing his praises and to declare his glory. Third, the reason why we worship. Okay, so we, we know that that's what we're going to do. But the reason why we worship, verse 25, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. I was able to pick out five reasons why we worship. First, God is great. First prayer I ever learned was a, was a grace that our family used to do. We would sit at the table, bow our heads and clasp our hands. God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. Amen. That's what we did every day. Our family did that grace. And I learned from a very early age, God is great. I didn't understand who he was, all that stuff that we just talked about, about Yahweh, Yeshua, and God's salvation, and how God uh, told us who he is. I didn't understand that. I was a five-year-old. But that is one of the reasons why we worship. God is great. That talks about God's being, his, the very essence of who he is. God is greatly to be praised. Those are God's actions. We praise him for his actions. What, is, what has God done? Not, not what has God done for you lately. What has God done? Look around you. 
It's immense. It's amazing. On my bucket list, I want someplace, somehow, to get to see the Northern Lights. Why? Because you cannot possibly see that kind of a visual and be unmoved by it. You, you know, oh, you know, even a, a non-believer goes, oh, isn't the universe amazing? Except a believer says, oh, God is so amazing. Go stand someplace in one of those dark, really truly dark places at night and look at the stars. It is amazing what God has done. We praise him greatly for his actions. God is to be feared above all other gods, it says. It's the third reason why we worship him. We worship him over any other god. Not that there are any other gods, because all the other gods, as, as the uh, version that Grace read, all the other gods are statues, <laughs> just worthless statues. You can buy one of those if you want one. You can buy one you know, at any dime store. Put the statue up. Worship it if you like but not this God. Because this God made the heavens, it says. God is omnipresent. He made everything that there is. God radiates splendor, majesty, strength, and joy. That's the other reason, the, the last reason why we worship. We worship because God it gives us joy to. You know, if you come into, into church every week, if this is the norm for you, and, and, you know, and you, you come in and it's all just seriousness and, you know, and, uh, oh, we have to worship God again and get this over with so we can get the coffee hour, you know. If that's, the, if that's how you feel when you come into church every week, you've missed something. I'm glad you're here, but we really want you to experience the joy of the Lord. It's so amazing. You, you see, I mean, if I ever did see the Northern Lights, I can tell you, I'd have a smile on my face that wouldn't go away for a week. I got to see that. I got to see God. See? Fourth, the cost of worship. Oh, yeah, there's a cost to it. <laughs> ascribe to the Lord, O families of the earth, ascribe to the Lord, this is verse 28, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe... To, to the Lord, get it? The glory due his name. There's a glory that's due to him. It's like a payment. Uh, bring an offering and come before him. Glory is due to God. You owe God your very life. You owe God your eternal life. These are the two great reasons for worship, actually. And they're the two great costs of worship. We owe him our lives. And that's a reason why do we, we'd, why we would worship him. Uh, if if you knew, if you really believed that you were not sufficient in yourself, and that the beating of your heart was dependent on another, then you would worship that other being, and that's what we're talking about. And we also owe him our eternal life, and that's reason to proclaim Christ among the nations. But drill down into the text, and you'll see it's the glory that's due to him. The first way in which we worship costs us in, in that it costs us our time. We come here to worship. God expects nothing of us because we're sinners. God expects nothing of you because you're a sinner. We have to relearn. We have to learn to do what those who live in the presence of God continually do naturally. The angels worship God continually. Isn't that amazing? They worship God because it's part of their being. And, you know, if, if, the, if the angels standing before the throne can say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power and wisdom and strength, for you created all things, and by your will they, were, they existed and are created. That's Revelation 4. If, if the angels see that in God, we have to relearn it because we don't see it naturally. And so we come to worship to, to relearn what we would naturally be doing if we'd never sinned. Come, bring an offering, it says. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 and 8 says, we've, we're commanded. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. 
and whoever sows bountifully will reap, will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. Here we're, 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 we're uh, commanded to make an offering. The size of it, that's up to you. The size of the offering is in proportion to what you've got. Remember the widow's mite story? So you may only have that much. And giving that much might be like the whole of your income. Or you might have this much. And giving this much will hurt a little. But the point is this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. We distribute, we give freely as a congregation. It's part of our ordination. And we distribute as God gives us to do. There are many ways of giving. And we're going to get into that in a, in a later message. But suffice it to say that giving to God through our offerings is one way in which we demonstrate to God our allegiance and our worship to him. We don't give to keep an institution going. If you're giving just to keep this building together, then that's not a good reason. We, we give because it's right to do, because God has, or has called it from us. So there's a mistake that a lot of churches make, and the, the mistake is that they, they think that their giving is for the program of the church. I, said, I think I've said this before, something like 85% of all the funds that are collected by all the churches in America, uh, all that money is used inside of a building. Only 15% is used for proclamation. If we have a building and staff and programs, these must be in submission to the one we worship, whom we proclaim. And all of it, the psalm writer says, is because of the fifth thing, the, the majesty that we worship in verses 30 and 31. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The final reason why we worship God is that God is our sovereign. This cuts against the grain of how Christians living in the United States in particular like to think. But, but his splendor is perfect holiness. He is a mighty being whom we would well tremble before if we hadn't been invited into his presence. And that joyfully, united with him in Christ, he gives us that profound, wonderful ability when we come to him. And he keeps the world spinning and fixes it on its rotation, all for his good pleasure. And so the psalmist concludes that the heavens themselves are glad and the very earth rejoices. And if you look up Psalm 19, you'll see the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. For the creation knows what we must learn. The Lord reigns. The Lord is sovereign. So ask yourself this morning after this brief review, am I a worshiper of God? After everything I just said, do I sing his praises? Do I declare his glory? Do I give in proportion to how I've received from him? And that's a separate question from the one that establishes whether you're a child of God. You become a child of God when you invite Jesus into your life. But are you a worshiper of God? Are we together striving to be worshipers of God? Take this question home with you. Here, here it is. Write it down. What is one way, just asking one way, in which I could engage, because worship is engagement, how could I engage in worshiping God with my church one way that I have not been fully engaged with up to this point? What's something that, that I could engage with more in worship? You know, it may take you a minute, because I think we have a lot of people who are engaged in worship, but it may take you a minute to think of a way in which you could be engaged more.
Um, and you know, I, these, are, these are priorities that we're working on. We'll never arrive at these. We work toward them. So what's a way in which I could up the worship of God in my life? Some days, the way in which you can become more engaged, as Jamie reminded us, is simply by showing up because it's all you've got. And we understand that. And there's got to be room for you here when that's the case. Others of us can engage more in worship by learning more to sing his praises, by learning more how to declare his glory. Some of us could engage more in worship by giving more. There's lots of ways. And if, you, if, if you're completely at a loss to think of how you could do it, ask me. I can make some more suggestions. And we, can dis we can dialogue about it. All right?